planning for trains on the moon, Chandra is getting shut down, the future of Mars helicopters, and an update on exomoons with Dr. David Kipping. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. I talk a lot about the future of humanity in space, and one of the big things that we need which will enable everything is going to be more infrastructure off of Earth. Think about propellant depots and uh, places for people to stay and live and growing food and communication systems. We just don't have any of that stuff yet. But DARPA is planning a new 10 year lunar architecture plan, which is called Luna 10. And last year, they sent out a request for proposals from a whole bunch of companies, you're going to be familiar with all of the names like Blue Origin and SpaceX and Northrop Grumman and all these different companies that you're familiar with. And they're looking for proposals for the moon specifically for construction, mining, transit, energy, agriculture, medicine, robotics, life sustainment, experiments, communication, digital infrastructure, and position and navigation. So those are the kinds of things that if there's going to be some long term human presence on the moon, these are the things that you want. One of the keys to this plan is that it's going to be peaceful and allow international access. But I mean, it's it's DARPA, right? They're defense. But anyway, we'll see how this all plays out. So now they're starting to hand out contracts to different companies that are going to be starting to investigate, create plans for this kind of infrastructure on the moon. And the one that we got this week was an announcement that Northrop Grumman had won a contract to study building trains on the moon. And you think about like what would a railway on the moon be used for? You've got all of this regolith that you're going to be digging up, you're going to be transporting it, there's going to be the need to pick up ice in the permanently shadowed craters on the moon, you need to transport that to a base, as well as moving supplies in between whatever buildings you have at a research station on the moon. So rail on the moon makes a ton of sense. We don't have any details yet. This is just the announcement that Northrop Grumman won the contract. And then hopefully over the coming year, we will find out more specific details. And I'd love some cool drawings of trains on the moon. Bad news for Chandra. Last week, we learned that NASA had $2 billion less put into its budget than it had asked for for upcoming fiscal year 2025. And that means cuts it means that they're going to have to trim back scale back, push deadlines out and shut missions down. And we learned this week that one of the missions that is probably on the chopping block is the Chandra X ray observatory. This spacecraft has been flying since 1999. It is one of the great observatories. Hubble, Chandra are the two remaining great observatories that are operational still. And it has done just an enormous amount of science. It has observed the regions around black holes, neutron stars, it's able to see objects in the higher end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So think supernova remnants, actively feeding black holes, pulsars, as well as giant clouds of intergalactic gas that are blasting out x rays into space. And a lot of the times it works with the other observatories, you get these combined images where Hubble Space Telescope gives us an image in the infrared visible and ultraviolet, and then Chandra gives us this image in the x rays. And so the news is that they're planning on shutting Chandra down. In the documents released by NASA, they say that the telescope is getting old, that it's having trouble regulating its temperature. But when we think of the amazing saves done by NASA over the decades, where we thought telescopes were dead and they were able to save them, rovers on Mars that are dragging a wheel behind them or using pressure from the sun to be able to orient the Kepler spacecraft when its reaction wheels failed, an increasing temperature isn't a death blow to this mission, they needed to cut budget. So the plan is to start shutting down the mission in 2025. And the problem is that there aren't many other instruments that can do the same kind of work. The European Space Agency has the XMM Newton telescope, which is also in x rays. And there's some other x ray capability on some other spacecraft, but nothing as incredible as Chandra. And there are no plans to build a replacement. Now, there were tentative plans, there was going to be a next big observatory called Lynx sort of proposed at the same time that we got LUVAR and HabEx and Origins. 
That was going to be the X-ray telescope. But after the decadal survey came together, astronomers focused on having the habitable worlds observatory as the next big flagship telescope that they want to build. So there are no plans to build another big X-ray telescope. This is really bad for high energy astronomy and just for astronomy in general, that if you could look at the universe in the wavelengths that are actually most common, you would see this universe in x rays. And yet one of the most important instruments to be able to perceive this is getting shut down. And there's going to be no replacement to come along to help it out. So uh, this is this is bad. It's time to de ice Euclid. Spacecraft are built on Earth, and then they're sent to space. But the problem is that whenever you build a spacecraft, no matter how careful you are, bits of the Earth's atmosphere are going to get into your spacecraft. And that includes water vapor that is just in air itself. Even if you try to dry out the room, you're still going to have some water vapor. And then when the spacecraft goes to space, that water vapor will boil off and then form this cloud that hovers around the telescope. And then this water vapor can get onto the optics of the various parts of the instrument. And it starts to make it just a little bit cloudy. And this is something that astronomers have seen every single time they launch a new space telescope. And so this was entirely expected for the Euclid mission. And they had a plan. First, they were going to try to minimize the amount that would actually collect inside the spacecraft by heating up different elements inside the spacecraft, even warming up parts of the telescope by the sun, and then hoping that the water vapor would evaporate and go off into space and not collect on the instruments. But there still is some of this water ice forming a thin layer on the optics inside Euclid. So now the European Space Agency is trying to remove this water ice. They've got a plan to de-ice the telescope while it's in space. And once again, they're going to independently heat different instruments inside the telescope. Their operating temperature is negative 140 Celsius, and they plan to bring that up in various cases to about minus three Celsius. And that's enough to get the ice to vaporize and then try to get it away from the telescope. So we'll see if this works. And if so, then this could be a template that's used by other telescopes. And so one of the problems, if you get this ice on your telescope, you can make it go away and you get an even more pristine view of the cosmos. What comes after Ingenuity? Ness's Mars Ingenuity helicopter flew over 70 times and we've reported on it countless times, but it's over now. On its last landing, it smacked one of its rotors against a sand dune, broke off a piece of the rotor. It is never going to fly again. But it demonstrated that taking a helicopter to Mars is an incredible idea that there's just like the perfect low gravity. There's enough density in the atmosphere. You can turn the rotors fast enough. You can recharge with solar panels. So now NASA engineers are wondering what could we do next? What would a future helicopter on Mars look like? So there's a plan that's been in the works called the Mars Science Helicopter. We've known about this since 2022. And it is a much beefier version of Ingenuity. It has six separate rotors on arms that stretch out, a much larger solar panel, and it would be able to carry 10 kilograms of science instruments airborne. And so last week at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference, we saw a presentation where someone was explaining what kinds of geology could be done with the Mars Science Helicopter. So just imagine there's this terrain on Mars that you can't reach with a rover. It's not safe to land. You can't crawl up it. And yet a helicopter could fly up and explore this jumbled terrain in Noctis Labyrinthus. You can imagine going down into places like Valles Marineris. You can imagine going up to high altitudes, place that a, a rover could never crawl up to. And one of the questions that scientists have is what is the geology of Mars? Although we've got these samples taken by Perseverance and Curiosity, we've got observations made by other rovers as well. And you've got these images taken from orbit, you really want that close up observation. Imagine if a helicopter could see some weird outcropping of rock, a mountain, and it could just fly up to the top of it, take a look, examine the geology. And so of an armada, a fleet of helicopters that are due to return to Mars. Every week, we put up a vote where you tell us what you thought was the most exciting story of the week. And this week, the winner by 
actually not a total landslide was the launch of the Starship Super Heavy for the third test flight, narrowly beating out that Voyager 1 is maybe coming back in contact. So thank you everybody who voted this week. We put the vote up on the community tab on our channel, or if you're just scrolling on your phone, scrolling, scrolling, and you see the vote come up, go ahead, just take a second, give us a vote, and we will count them up and we'll celebrate them here next week. Now, the best way to make sure that you see the vote is subscribe to the channel and click on the notifications bell, and then like watch a couple other videos so that YouTube knows that it wants to put videos in your feed, then you almost certainly see the poll next week. Explaining the debris around Supernova 1987A. The last close supernova that astronomers have seen was in 1987, when a star exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is about 168,000 light years away. Now, I understand that the light has taken 168,000. Am I overly sensitive about this now? Anyway, I understand the light took 168,000 years to get here, and so when we saw it, it was over 168,000 years ago, but Astronomers talk about things now for when we perceive them. So we saw a supernova in 1987. And then over the following decades, astronomers have been able to watch the expanding debris cloud around this supernova. But they noticed this really strange behavior in the last few years, which is that you're getting these bright glowing blobs, which is called a string of pearls that surrounds where the supernova went off. It's important to note that this material is not actually like an expanding shock wave of material coming from the supernova. This is actually material that was thrown out as the star was dying in the tens of thousands, maybe even millions of years before it actually died. You had these outer layers drifting away from where the star was. But then as the supernova went off, it illuminated all of this material so we could see what had actually happened. And so you've got these weird blobs in this very regular pattern around where the supernova went off. Why? Astronomers have doing a bunch of simulations and they think it comes down to turbulence. So think about an airplane when an airplane is flying, it's got the contrails that are coming up behind the airplane and the vortices of wind that come off of the wingtips of the plane will cause the contrails to turn into these blobs, they'll break up and turn into these blobs because you're getting these shear effects that the that the contrails moving in one direction, but then it's kind of shearing back and forming these larger blobs. And from what they can tell, the same process is happening where you've got this material that was thrown out, but is also interacting with the interstellar intergalactic wind and curling back on itself and with vortices forming and it's breaking up into these separate chunks. And so astronomers did a simulation using the forces as they understand it. And they predicted they should get 32 of these clumps around the supernova. And in fact, when they count them, there's between 30 and 40 of these clumps. One impact, 2 billion craters. Mars is covered in impact craters. And traditionally it was thought, well, these all were caused by asteroids crashing into Mars. But in fact, not all of them came from space. In fact, some of them came from Mars itself. Researchers were looking at this crater called Corinto, and it's relatively new as Mars craters go. It's only 2.34 million years old. It has this big ejecta blanket where material was blasted off and across onto the surface of Mars. And so researchers looked at the craters that had been formed, not from the original impact, but this material spraying out from the impact site and landing further downrange. And in fact, they calculated that not only you're getting this single impact, now the secondary craters are causing even more craters. And some of these craters are really far away, like 2000 kilometers away on the surface of Mars, you get these secondary impacts. And so when they estimated the total number of impacts, secondary impacts, tertiary impacts, who knows how many you go down the road, it was around 2 billion craters all came from that one impact crater on Mars. DART really messed up Dimorphos. When NASA's DART spacecraft crashed into asteroid Dimorphos, the hope was, can we change the orbit of an asteroid, the kind of asteroid that could potentially harm us here on Earth? And the answer was yes. After DART crashed into Dimorphos, it shortened the orbital period 
by 33 minutes and 15 seconds. And if this was an asteroid that was on a potential dangerous trajectory with Earth, then it would show that yes, you can change the trajectory and that would build up over the years and what would be a hit to Earth would turn into a miss. But astronomers wanted to know what else happened to Dimorphos from this impact. And what they learned was that it actually changed the very shape of the asteroid. So prior to the impact, as DART was zooming in on Dimorphos, it was taking images of it and sending these images back home. And so astronomers were able to measure the shape of the asteroid and it was an ablate spheroid. The Earth is an ablate spheroid and in its spins turns into this ablate spheroid. It's like a sphere that's been squished. But after the impact, they used the Goldstone radar to image the shape of Dimorphos, and they found that it now is what's called a triaxial ellipsoid, or technically an oblong watermelon. So imagine a watermelon and then squished a little to the side. And that is now the shape of Dimorphos. And who knows, it will, it will eventually slowly shift itself back towards an oblong spheroid over time. So it just shows not only can we change their orbit, but we can really mess up their shape. The dinosaurs would be proud. Recently, I told you that the Cycle 3 announcements from James Webb Space Telescope are out, and one of the winning proposals was a search for exomoons led by Dr. David Kipping. I interviewed David before they were granted time on James Webb, but I wanted to do a follow-up on how things went, what he's going to be looking for, exactly how much time he has, and so on. So here's a short update with Dr. David Kipping. So David, you actually were successful. You, you, yeah. you asked for a, a, a like large amount of time. You felt a little nervous about what was about the ask, but it, it all came together. What happened? Yeah, I guess we got the 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 Fraser Kane bump, and it just it oh, yeah, pushed us over the edge. I think that's yeah, what yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah, it must have been. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I, I don't the know. Committee. We we we're obviously through. We're over the moon. Um, it, I think finally it's a good sign for the future that the committees are now receptive to searching for exomoons. So I, I think overall, it's very exciting, not just for this, this cycle, but for the future cycles that we can expect more of this. But you also had to offer measurements of the ablateness of exoplanets at the same time to also searching for exomoons. Right. But you know, that's, uh, that was a definitely a big extra positive to our proposal because whether we find moons or not, we're really confident we will be able to measure the ablateness to very high precision of this exoplanet, which is the first time that's been done. It will actually give us the obliquity. So that's so, you know, the Earth is 23 degrees tilted over on its side. That's what gives us the seasons. We could measure that for an exoplanet for the first time. It'll even tell us about the rotation rate and we can measure the angle between the satellite system and that angle. And it's just, there's all sorts of like amazing science we can do. So I think that definitely helped us a lot. But it has to be said, there was another the program searching for exomoons that was also accepted um, around uh, TY700. So clearly, uh, and, and I don't think there's any mention of uh, ablateness there. So I think clearly committees are excited about the exomoon hunt in its own right, which is fantastic okay. news. So do you know when you're slotted, what time you're going to be getting on the telescope? Yeah, there's only one time because this object only transits every three years. So this is October 26th this year that it's going to be coming around. So yeah, it's kind of wild that for 70, almost 72 hours, so three days, JWST will be taking photos. And I've, it's just a really unnerving thing to think over those three days, you'll, you know, I'll be looking up at the sky and thinking this $10 billion piece of equipment is doing, just imaging the same thing over and over again, because I asked it to. That, that's right. a very strange feeling, yeah. but exciting too. <laughs> but you also have to hope that nothing exciting happens during that time. No really cool supernovae, no bright comets in the sky, no accidentally colliding asteroids, nothing that would turn Webb's gaze in another direction. That's true. Yeah, I hope there's not a like a, a second Oumuamua or something that comes through that week because that would be bad for us and probably right. everyone would turn away. Yeah. And the exact moment that's going to pass in front of a star to do a transit is exactly when you need to do your observations. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's the time critical nature of observations that led to it being selected, I suspect, because 
if it's an observation that you can do like, you know, like there's 10 opportunities a year to do this, then maybe they'll think, okay, let's do this cycle four, which is next year or cycle five, the year after. But we have to get this this year. And in JWST, you know, who knows how long it will last? People are saying it could last for 20 years, but if it gets hit by another meteorite, it could get damaged and we could lose the same kind of abilities we have now. So time really is crucial and we don't want to, you know, have the promise of in 10 years we'll do this experiment. We want to do it now because we might want to go back in three years and confirm the observations and three years after that to measure other things about these exomoons. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they've agreed with us that this is, this is worth doing now. And so you get that data in October. How long do you think it's going to take you to crunch it? Yeah, we have a 12 month proprietary period, which is pretty standard for JWST. So we have 12 months until the data goes public, that means, and everybody can access it. And I think that's good. I think it gives us a bit of time just not to rush things and do things properly and, you know, dot the T's and cross the I's, whatever, get all that correct. Um, but we are hoping to make a light curve much faster than that, of course. And so uh, my student, Ben, who's going to be leading this, he's going to be heading out to Space Telescope this summer um, and hopefully running through lots of almost simulated downloads, like imagining we get the data and pushing the button and seeing how fast we can get these light curves out so that when October 26th comes around, pretty much as soon as we get the data, we'll be able to make a light curve within, you know, a couple of days or so, maybe in a few hours. And then we can get into the exciting stuff of looking for these little dips. But but if that light curve tells you that you're looking at a, at an exomoon, like, do you think it will be obvious or do you think it is going to require the you're going to need to run out the entire clock 12 months crunch 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 it depends on how big it is if it's a moon which is um the size of mars which we don't really expect or even the size of earth it would be extremely obvious like he it would just pop right out of the data if it was the size of ganymede uh we're predicting that'd be a five sigma so five sigma is actually normally visible by eye you can normally like think about the higgs boson detection that was a five sigma and you could see the bump by eye in the data so we would expect that to be visible but we might still have concerns whether that bump was an artifact of the data or some kind of something strange happened with the telescope at that time so that's where the real hard work begins is like making sure there's not something peculiar that happened that could be tricking us um obviously the bigger the signal is the less likely it is the telescope would be tricking us um so that's that's and it's hard to predict how long that would take but um obviously we've got experience with doing that with hubble um and so i feel confident we'll be able to we'll get through that with certainly within the 12 months and hopefully much faster congratulations again i look forward to the science results from this either way even yeah, a null result is interesting yeah, absolutely. all right all right thanks david Thanks, Fraser. Hope you enjoyed that short update with David. Do you like these like little interviews inside a larger Space Bites? Let me know and maybe we'll add more of these in the future. Every week, I send out my email newsletter, which goes out to about 75,000 people. And I write every word. The thing is totally free. There's no ads. It's just a way for you to receive as much space news as you can handle. And we just cover a fraction of the total news here on Space Bites. There's actually upwards of 40 stories that we're covering on Universe Today every single week. So I want to just whet your appetite for other stories that we just didn't have time to get to here. So for example, a new map of 1.3 million quasars, a mission that could land near a lava tube skylight and then hop around the outside of the skylight imaging down below with a LIDAR. And astronomers think they found the most massive supercluster to date. So definitely sign up for the email newsletter. I send it out every Friday afternoon. So you've still got time right now to sign up. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. I'm going to talk about defunding telescopes for a little bit. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Antonio Lofilara, David Gilton, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstis, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. This is tough, and we've seen this happen before in the past, where we hear that NASA is planning on defunding some project. This time it's Chandra. But like, do you remember when New Horizons was a threat of being defunded? And in fact, there's been several other times where missions that are still in the prime of their life, still under use by scientists, completely oversubscribed, someone says, well, we may have to shut this project down. And 
then we get this large outpouring of support. We get people writing their elected officials telling that this is really important to them. And so you're seeing this kind of operation happen again for Chandra. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be interviewing one of the people behind the Chandra Space Telescope so we can find out more information about what the telescope did and how people can get involved. And we'll also put some links to some efforts online where people are going to try to show support for the Chandra Space Telescope. It would suck if we lost this telescope. And so I really hope that it's able to get more time before it does finally on its own terms have to be shut down. All right. We'll see you next week.